Aloha, and welcome back to Politics in Hawaii with Dennis Isaki on Think Tech Hawaii. Today we'll be speaking with Mauna Kea Trask, a fourth generation Native Hawaiian attorney on Hawaiian issues. He is a practicing attorney on Kauai in the areas of environmental law and mitigation, land use, zoning, and entitlements. He is a graduate of Kamehameha School, University of Hawaii Law School, and uh, has been a county attorney, uh, been a prosecuting attorney, worked with a public defender's office, and clerk for judges in the first and fifth circuit courts. Among other public service, he has served on the Kauai Nihau Burial Council. Monakia, welcome to Politics in Hawaii. Mahalo, Dennis. Yeah. Good to see you. Good to see you. Please tell us about your passion on Native Hawaiian issues, starting with that. Sure. Um, basically, just was raised in it. I, um, you know, given my family's history and involvement, in Native Hawaiian issues and rights. It was just something that I was, you know, raised to do and brought up around. Yeah, I know you, uh, you get uh, families that your aunt is on the Oahu Board of Trustees. Yeah, um, so my grandfather was Arthur Kalko Trask Sr. His brother was uh, Bernard Trask and his daughters, Lilani, Hananike, um, and the, I mean, there's all kinds though, multi generations. Yeah, you know, picked it up today. My cousin's a Big Island like that. Yeah, thanks. Um, you've been associated with the film Fishing Pono. Can you tell us about that? Oh yeah, that was uh, a film project uh, produced by Terry Tico, and it was just basically about uh, Uncle Mac Poi Poi and what he did at Mo'omomi on Molokai. And um, it was a small documentary, but really explored the good work that he did and um, you know the Molokai community did in their uh, protecting their resource. Oh, well, I thought you were going into movie industry or something. I know. <laughs> <laughs> OK, let's uh, go to uh, uh, DHHL, Department of Hawaiian Homelands. I guess uh, you're getting some uh, discussion in the legislature and funding for Hawaiian issues. Uh, uh, can you tell us your thoughts on the Department of Hawaiian Homeland, if they can do things differently, provide more housing? Yeah, definitely. Um, so, you know, as you know, and, and it's it's been said, uh, throughout this legislative session, there were two main bills that sought to allocate to OHA their 20% share of the public land trust revenues. Um, and they're still advocating for that right now. And that's been, you know, the result of decades of litigation and legislation since about the 2000s. And um, currently, I think, you know, actually, I got the numbers here. If you'll, if you'll forgive me. Yeah. So annual PLT revenue is about three hundred ninety-four million. So that means OHA's share would be seventy-eight point nine million, and currently they're receiving fifteen point one. So out of the twenty percent, instead they're getting about three point eight, and so that would go to, you know, give into OHA as trustee for the betterment of the Hawaiian people. And then DHHL and OHA, I mean, you know, they're, they're separate agencies, but they are related. OHA, the way I see it, is more the administrative and financial kind of arm of whatever is the Hawaiian government right now. Um, and DHHL is the land, the corpus and the body. So it would be great if they could work together uh, somehow and, as far as your, your quest, first question goes, that's a big one. I think, um, you know, a lot's been written about it and a lot's been discussed. I definitely certainly don't want to criticize today. That's not why I'm here. But I mean, arguably, 
the Department of Hawaiian Homelands has had a real hard time since its inception. Um, you know, part of it was to facilitate Hawaiians returning to their land, preserving their self-determination, cultural values, and also to, I mean, it was horse trading, right? What, what the Hawaiian Homes Commission Act is a result of Congress. And so you have sugarcane interests at the time were lobbying to keep their land leases and, and all that kind of, um, you know, the disputes and history regarding that. So I, I definitely think DHHL could do more. Um, I don't know if, if they can, given the current, you know, structure of it, but I don't think that's necessarily the fault of the department or anyone in particular. It's, it's systemic, I think. Yeah, I, I think one of the differences with OHA and uh, DHHL is uh, DHHL, at least on the uh, initial last seas, they got a that fifty percent uh, blood quantum rate, and OHA there's no minimum requirement, right? Well, great point. So originally. I think um, the number was Prince Kuhio wanted 132nd Hawaiian in order to qualify for DHHL end. And they settled on 50. I know there was a push to make it 100, but I mean, even 1920s, 100 was maybe a couple of Niihau, Molokai, you know? Uh, Wainiha, maybe. Um, but OHA is no blood quantum. I think it's more consistent with the native Hawaiian culture and how we view ourselves. And it's just, if you have an ancestor, you can trace the 1777, you know, you're good to go. Um, yeah, but there's a push to reduce that, right? It, was there a resolution or something? Yeah, and, and for the years they've been trying to do that. And I think that's good because one of the problems of DHHL may be it's, it's limited uh, reach and extent. Like for me, it's hard to quantify, but let's say I'm around, I'm around a quarter, so I can't get land. So I have to buy normal property and I pay my mortgage to the bank and all that. I would love to get Hawaiian homelands and pay mortgage that could benefit other native Hawaiians. Maybe I could pay it to DHHL and they could flip it and use it to support, you know, other Native Hawaiian people and their interests. When you look socioeconomically, Hawaiians are at the bottom of the of the ladder in Hawaii. And so even, even beyond that, those Hawaiians that are 50% tend to be even lower, you know, and, and to build a, a, a program, self-sustaining program on that portion of a population that's just been so historically marginalized and subject to injustice, it makes it very difficult to make it work, I think. Um, yeah, that could be the reason why that 50 or so lots in Anhola, although it was developed, roads constructed, lands all cleared, utilities put in over five years ago, have not been awarded. I understand this is uh, going to be awarded like real soon now, but it's set for. I think it's about five years. Um, I don't know if it's because of the qualification. If if the J child builds the home, they gotta pay. The land is basically free or a dollar a year, but they gotta pay for the houses, right? Yeah, you know, I'm not specifically aware of, of that. You know what the details are on on yeah. that project, but. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of issues that they got to deal with, and it's too bad because there's over two hundred thousand acres. And I think if the department could figure out how to make it work better, or a representative in Congress could assist at that level, you could do huge. Um, there could there could be huge gains in addressing the housing crisis. You know, a lot of the people without houses and homeless are native Hawaiian. And there's a lot, there's land, there's water. I mean, you know, the limits of development is largely water and DHHL has their specific allocation of the public trust. So there's a lot of opportunity there, but not a lot of execution. I mean, as a matter of fact. You know, one, one interesting thing about 
PHHL pro properties uh, with regards to the lessees, uh, the Kauai County Council, uh, they made it so they don't have to pay any real property tax to their Hawaiians. So, you know, not on the land, not on the, because it's not theirs, not even on the houses. I think the other counties tax their houses, you know. But the thing is, what about the other Native Hawaiians, 50% or even 100% if they're not on DHHL land, they gotta pay property tax. So that kind of doesn't make sense to kind of interesting. Oh yeah, I love I love to pay less tax. Yeah, no, but you know, like they don't have to pay if they're over there, but then you gotta pay, right? Oh yeah, well that's, and that's the thing, yeah. you know, getting into more deep into the, the sovereignty discussion, um, you know, with the with the lens, it's really it's DHHL's corpus, and so they don't have to follow. I mean, they do require in their own rules, you you comply with building codes and county zoning, but they don't have to. They can do their own. But um, as far as being Hawaiian and getting separate treatment, that that can't be done until there's federal recognition, you know, which is a whole other issue. Yeah, I understand that, but. Um... It's not a thing, the county, you know, it's a county issue that, you know, whether they get a pay tax or not. The point is that if you don't, if you're not fortunate enough to get a DHHL uh, lease, then you doubly, you know, penalized, but you get a pay tax, right? Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. you know, in that regard, yeah. that kind of touches on the Kalima yeah. case, right? Yeah. So that's one of the issues is that if you were otherwise qualified, but you couldn't get property yeah. um, and you had to pay mortgage, you had to pay, you know, like everybody else, because you couldn't have access to land, you, you're supposed to get a portion of the settlement. I don't, I don't know what it is, but they're, they're moving towards that right now. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, what about the, uh, you know what? Oha is working on right now or yeah I think um well they're they're doing they're advocating strongly for their 20 percent at the ledge this year um I did some I looked at it last night I think um what is it SB there were two SB 2122 and SB 2021 um SB 2021 Senate draft one, House draft two's got legs. And um, currently it's been, uh, the House sent it back with some amendments, Senate disagree with the amendments and Senate conferees were, reported, uh, were appointed. So we'll see how that goes. And then OHA for the past couple of years, they've been going through their own kind of reevaluation and, and trying to, you know, at least what they say sharpen the program and improve it, which is always good. I mean, we can always do better, you know, in in, in our goals and missions in life. So, uh, can you elaborate uh, on the those bills that you mentioned? Well, sure. So, um, yeah, again, going back to the public land trust, so. The Hawaiians, Hawaiians are supposed to get 20% and um, they never have gotten it. And so Lingle made a deal back in 2006, I believe. They were to get about 15 million a year and it's never changed. So the, the legislature right now is looking to set that and, and distribute it. And so right now, the current draft of Senate Bill 2021 and I'm reading from my notes, so I apologize, but it establishes um, OHA's pro rata share of the monies derived from the public land trust, establishes a working group to determine that share of income and the proceeds of the public land trust and back amounts due. And it appropriates funds from the carry forward trust holding account to OHA. And so we'll see where that goes. You know. Okay, so if there's an agreement or legal uh, right to get the money. So uh, why 
why aren't they getting the money from the state? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. I think, I mean, there's always things, right? That the, the state has to look yeah. at, but, and they have to look at everybody. That's part of the difficulty with being wards of the state is Hawaiians are subject to the state legislature. And so if you were to take Hawaiians out of it, maybe it'd be different, maybe it'd be better. Yeah. Okay, and, um, well, one of the questions is, uh, are the Hawaiian, Native Hawaiians like the uh, uh, Native American Indians? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, yes, I think practically and historically, um, Native Americans were the indigenous people of the continent of the United States. And um, the constitution recognizes that Congress shall have the power to make treaties with native tribes is the term of art. But of course, over time, they're like first nation people. I think they're called now. And similarly, um, Native Hawaiians are, are the indigenous people of Hawaii, and that is recognized in HRS 10H, which is state recognition of Native Hawaiians. And, but but there's, there is disagreement. A lot of Native Hawaiians in the Native Hawaiian community do not consider themselves tribes. It was an independent, sovereign nation. There was agreements and treaties between the Kingdom of Hawaii and, I mean, numerous European states in America, treaties of friendship, reciprocity, all this kind of stuff. And um, that is an important distinction, but I do think that, you know, semantics aside from the 18th and 19th century, Native Hawaiians should be afforded the same recognition as Native Americans, and currently they aren't at the federal level. So I would answer that question specifically, they are, Native Hawaiians are not like Native Americans because Native Americans are recognized. So they can have their own land, they got their own police force, they don't deal with the state government, they're separate nations. They're nations within the nation of you know, America, United States. Okay, Whereas can we Hawaii, continue on this, Daryl? We'll take a short break. Sure, sure. Hey, welcome back to Think Tech Hawaii with Mauna Kea Tras. Uh, Mauna Kea, uh, can you please continue on the federal recognition of Hawaiians? Sure. So, yeah, just wrapping up that question as far as whether Native Hawaiians are just like Native Americans, because of the lack of federal recognition, they are not, I don't think. And that's why you see Native Americans, um, you know, they, 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 they define their own tribal status. So you may or may not have to have any blood quantum. A lot of them don't. They have their own property. They can gamble on it if they want. And um, they really have self-determination and control at the federal level. We don't. And that's why, for example, Rice v. Cayetano, although the state constitution says only Hawaiians can vote in an OHA election, the Supreme Court said because effectively there's no federal recognition, the Hawaiian only preference is illegal discrimination based on race or other suspect class. So if we were to get federal recognition, we could we'd be recognized as a political class and not a racial one. And we'd be subject to different 
right you know we wouldn't be subject to state regulation necessarily we could define it but that's the hawaiian community can the the, the uh, agree on that or really proceed forward with it so there's difficulties there yeah i i recall uh clayton he at that time we was with oh they went up to washington to discuss that and i guess like you said they said that everybody gets to vote on uh in Oha, right? Mm -hmm. um, and there's difference of opinions in uh, federal recognition, even even at the Santa Caucus time, right? There was it, not nothing happened on that. And you mentioned they got different um, point groups or thoughts. Uh, you, you think the uh, uh, the Alamihi syndrome, <laughs> Alamihi or the black crab syndrome got anything to do in there? Uh, you're going to be in trouble. Um, <laughs> you're, you're real quick, I, I don't think so. I think that, you know, Native Hawaiians are people yeah. too. And we're not uh, like any community or population. We don't all agree on everything. I think it's unfair to say so. And I, so I don't necessarily think it's a you know it's a crab in a bucket deal <laughs> but i do think that it's it's um it's kind of a ploy because you look at america right it's not purple it's blue and red pretty much down the middle and it's getting harder and so to, to require hawaiians to all agree on one position where americans don't have or you know non-hawaiians don't have to maybe that's not the fairest standard um in my in my opinion shpd that uh, has come to light in many projects in many situations uh they've been uh looked at it from both sides some guys the developers say it's hindering things some guys say you know we're not doing enough uh you get any thoughts on shpd um yeah i think um well, first off, I, I, I do know people in SHPD and I, I work with them all the time. And I'd like to acknowledge that because I, you know, I may not be unbiased, but I think they do a great job. They're, they're a very limited office. They have limited funding. You maybe got a handful of people that got to do every single project review statewide. I mean, from big to small, everything. So it's, it's a very difficult job and I don't even know if it's doable given what they have to do. And um, so they, you know, they do their review, they make their call. I think they make it, you know, the best they can according to their professional training and people will disagree on both sides. It's impossible to make everyone happy. And I think that, you know, it's, they, they do land use review and projects for entitlements. And the difficult thing is that's where you see a lot of the the hawaiian activism and concerns focus they go to the planning commission they go to the luc and really aside from protecting traditional customary rights and ensuring the continuity of, of those it's not a venue to talk about native hawaiian sovereignty generally the in, historical injustices or anything and that's what you see a lot of that i know you've seen it you know i've seen it and so um, if you're if you're in that that room on that day at that time, you're gonna get you know caught up in the current. And um, and if there's big waves, you're gonna get pounded. Yeah, that um, you know, not that I get anything against anybody in there or on the other side, and uh, not even with activism, but I've seen uh, to put it like they got more than one bite at the apple, you know, you do one one uh, project, they say, okay, you gotta do this. And then they come back and do something else on the same piece of land. Say we want, now we want more, more, uh, you know, just a specific example, you split a, split a lot in half, you gotta do something, so you get, uh, to an historic easement or something, 
then you go and combine it back together. They, they say, oh yeah, we'll make it bigger now just because we can. It seems like that sometimes, I don't know. Yeah, that's a, I mean, that's a good point. And I, you know, when I was at County, I, I dealt a lot with Hawaiian issues. You know, Mayor Carvalho was very attentive to him. He was very, you know, sympathetic. And that's good. I think all policymakers should be. Um, you have to acknowledge what Native Hawaiians have to deal with, um, both collectively and individually. And um, I mean, a lot of it has to do with, I think primarily, a lot of the Hawaiian activists speak straight from the now. And, you know, it's they, they feel it in their guts and that's what they're going from. But interestingly enough, I mean, if you, if you look at, um, you know, those figures in, in, in the community that are just beyond question. So you got like David Malo, Samuel Kamakau. If you read their books and um, they say really interesting things about it. So for example, in Kamo'olelo Hawaii, which was written 1835, um, David Malo, in talking about oral traditions and everything, he says that, um, you know, we know by experience that the Na'au is the most deceitful of all things. And so, which is really interesting now, especially in social media and, and really people coming at an emotional level. I guess where I'm going with this is, you know, when a project starts with entitlements, it's maybe five, 10 years until it, they break ground. And so you have a whole different generation of activism. So I think that's why you see one group being consulted and they get in their input. And then five, 10 years later, you'll see it, the, the young, the next generation come up. And when the dozers come, they show up. And a lot of that is education, it's training. And I think, you know, if maybe if OHA gets that 20%, they could put that towards educating Hawaiians in civics and teaching them how to, you know, be more savvy in the development process. Because, you know, me and you, I mean, we're from Kauai. We, were, we went through Iniki. And so when I look at it, if a building goes up, I don't see it as losing anything because Hurricane Cum is going to wipe it out anyway. I mean, you know, we're all one lava flow, one, one storm away from 1777. So we just got to keep fighting, keep moving on. I remember you saying something like that after a flood or something, you know, after uh, we met at Wainiha with uh, Mayor Cavalio, <laughs> and I remember you telling the guys, yeah, I'll look at this coastal ocean will get wiped out someday. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you know, his, I mean, traditionally, Hawaiians never own land, right? Yeah. Our power was yeah. to access it. And so I don't care who pays a million dollars for the paper, as long as, you know, we got the rights. And so as long as we know them and use them accordingly and, and responsibly, I think that you know, we will keep having moves and, um, you know, the Konani game will go on. Okay, we get uh, only a really short time left. Maybe a, just a short, short brief uh, thought on the uh, Kapa'akai analysis. Yeah, so Kapa'akai is, you know, it was 2000, uh, what was it? I think it's 2011. Uh, I'm sorry, September 11, 2000. So the Supreme Court came up with a test to help evaluate how to protect and identify traditional customary rights. So essentially, you have to identify whether any uh, rights exist, identify the extent in which they are exercised, identify the extent to which those rights and resources may be affected or impaired by the development, and specify feasible action, if any, to be taken to protect those rights. And it's really just trying to figure out how to make that work and practically speaking, because basically you, you're gonna have it come before a commission of you know seven to nine lay people who wanna do the best they can. And it's complicated stuff. Uh, you deal with a room of 15 to 30 you know, distraught people who sincerely uh, articulate a concern. Um, you're not gonna take that lightly. And so it's it, it's another test to assist, but like anything, I think um, it's creating its own issues and difficulties. And so we just keep it on, keep doing the best we can. Yeah, I think the, the county uh, is kind of like putting more emphasis on that now. 
or mm -hmm. you know looking more into it and having people uh, delve more into it um but maybe we're discussing on this later we're running out of time so any uh last words no i just thank you so much for the opportunity yeah. dennis happy to speak with you and uh, yeah. look forward to it again yeah yeah we'll uh, continue this there's a lot more to talk about yeah thanks for your time mahalo to our guests monokia trask and mahalo to the viewers on think tech hawaii if you like the think tech free media shows please help support this nonprofit platform with a donation Aloha, ahoi ho, malama pono. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.